Welcome. Our session this afternoon is titled SMC Equity Experiences, Community Shareout from the Racial Equity Leadership Alliance Partners. My name is Nick Fox and I'm a member of the PDC committee. Uh, Kristen and Jessica have a Q&A portion at the end of their presentation. So if you could just hold all questions uh, until that point. Um, you feel free to use the chat if you would like. Um, I'll be monitoring that and also letting uh, participants come in as they enter. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our hosts, Kristen and Jessica. Thank you, Nick. Um, Thanks, welcome, Nick. everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Krug. And I am Kristen Ross. And we represent the English and math departments, respectively. And we'd like to welcome you to our um, share out. So we were um, invited to join um, a, a group of SMC leaders at the California Community Colleges Racial Equity Leadership Alliance seminar, a series. Um, and the one that we attended was um, entitled Equitable Policy Implementation. And um, the reason Kristen and I were invited to this is that um, the example that Dr. Harper used in his presentation was AB 705, and we both teach um, formerly developmental, currently co rec courses in both English and math. So this is our area of expertise. So to kind of set the ground, in case you're not familiar with AB 705, it um, is a bill that requires that a community college district or college maximize the probability that a student will enter and complete transfer level coursework in English and math within one year, within a one year time frame. And that, you know, that is the actual language of the law and that is what it, exactly what it says. And we'll get to why that's significant in a moment. And it also eliminates the use of placement tests to um, have students um, decide which, which route to take. <clears throat> so what does that do or what does that mean? It essentially eliminates all remedial coursework and it eliminates placement tests and instead replaces placement tests with student self-reported grades and um, transcripts. So we now offer co-requisite support simultaneously in our transfer level courses in English and math. So students are taking the standard transfer level course with a couple of non-credit units attached to give extra time to do some of that support time, support work in the actual um, transfer level course. So a little background on why the state thought this was a great idea. And that is that remediating remediation research is really counterintuitive. What we think happens or what we expect to happen is not what the evidence shows us. So for example, research suggests that college remediation is a mixed bag at best. There isn't a lot of evidence that shows that it works at all. And further, a variety of studies show that the conventional approach to developmental education, which is for us was the same, a sequence of courses does not actually increase underprepared students pr probability of succeeding in college level classes because most students don't finish the entire sequence. Not because they can't, but because there are so many barriers, they just gas out. It's not, an, it's not a skill thing, it's a will thing. So what we have discovered is that AB 705 works as it was designed. Our remedial tracks have been eliminated and far more students are completing transfer level courses than ever before. But AB 705 was not intended to be an equity intervention. So in that opening slide, you saw that the language is very clear and very brief. <laughs> Get students through transfer level classes within a year, period and don't use placement tests. So what was really interesting is Dr. Harper talked, you know, set up his discussion about how to then take policies and implement them equitably. And he did a deep dive into discussing this implementation through the prism of racial equity. And he shared um, a quotation that we thought was really powerful. It is always better to front end equity as opposed to trying to back end it after the money has been given and the policy created. And in all honesty, this is what's happening across the state. Um, I'm very active in the California Acceleration Project, CAP group, which has been supporting AB 705 work. And um, the first round of our discussions was all about getting the, the policy in place. And now on the back end, all of the conversations about are about equity.
whoops, sorry. So Dr. Harper's presentation <laughs> had four kind of main chunks, and we're going to use this as our organizing principle for our presentation as well. So we started kind of getting people thinking about this idea with a poll, and then he discussed and shared the consequences of racial avoidance. Then he told us to follow the money. And then finally, he had us ha um, kind of wrestle with a breakout session question, and we were going to use that same format. So before we even started having our conversation, he um, started with a poll question or a poll statement um, on Zoom. Employees at my college usually discuss the racial implications of policies we create before implementing them. And as people, you'll notice it's more than 100%, right? I'm not doing my math wrong, Kristen. <laughs> so some people I think answered multiple times, but the upshot of it is that less than half of the audience said that agreed either somewhat or strongly that this is something that they do talk about it before policies are implemented. It tends to be an after the fact discussion once the evidence starts rolling in. So Dr. Harper, who runs the racial <clears throat> the Center for Race and Equity at USC, um, discussed the consequences of racial avoidance, and he said that it undermines equity. It invalidates the needs, outcomes, and experiences of specific racial groups. It leads to flawed and incomplete analysis. It fuels racial tensions. And this is bolded because this is what is happening for us too. Instead, it reproduces racial inequities, manufactures racial disparities, and leads to the miscarriage of racial justice, which ultimately produces racist outcomes. So what does that look like in our context? So this is from um, the chancellor's office. They have a new data page that allows us to trace our, <coughs> our um, outcomes in 8705 courses. And there's three significant pieces to this chart that, are, that um, we'll discuss. The first top part is the percentage of students who attempted college um, transfer level English in the first year and successfully completed. And you'll notice that the percentage of students who attempted it has gone down. Um, but we were told that this was going to happen because <clears throat> far more students are getting a shot at the class. So that was something we were kind of prepared for. What I want to draw your attention to is the second layer of um, the second bar graph shows the su successful transfer level completion counts in English. Now we started, we were early adopters. So you'll notice that um, our, you know, our shift starts to happen in 2018. That's when we implemented, which was a year ahead of when we were uh, mandated to do so. So <clears throat> you'll notice that in the very first year, we had, oh gosh, I can't do the, the math in my head that quickly, um, a thousand more completions than we'd ever had before. And that in the second year of implementation, even though our, our completion rate of, for the group went down slightly, the number of people who actually completed went up. So at first glance, this is, looks like it's doing what it's supposed to do. But then you get to the third chart. And the third chart is the same data disaggregated by race. And what you'll notice is that there has been a consistent equity gap um, throughout the course. And this is where a, our um, co-rec course um, came into being. And you'll notice that in the last year, even though completions went up, the <coughs> um, equity gaps have actually gotten worse, not better. So this is cause for concern. Math has a similar trajectory, but math, um, the math department just implemented 8705 in 2019. So the change is this last piece here. And similarly, you notice that completion rates went down, but the numbers of students who got through actually went up. So more students are successfully completing transfer level math in, the, in their first year than ever before. And it's consistent, right? But notice this is alarming, right? Just like in English, the equity gap has actually increased with the advent of AB705, not decreased. And so just as Dr. Harper suggested and warned that, you know, thinking about equity on the back end can be problematic. So we've already implemented this policy and yet we're exacerbating our equity gaps. 
Hi, everyone. So I'll pick up the second half of this presentation. Great job, Jessica. So another focal point of Dr. Sean Harper's presentation was to follow the money. Dr. Harper suggests that there's an overwhelming data that'll show how colleges spend their equity money. He conducted a free response survey to the audience members in attendance on the presentation. The prompt was, what ways have you witnessed your institution spend equity money? The responses poured in and the responses ranged from the purchases of iPads for faculty to toasters in the break room to covering faculty salaries and updating computer labs. And the list went on and on. And this seemed to invigorate Dr. Harper and also served as the perfect segue into his next focus point. Next slide, Jess. which was how to not misuse equity funds. And so when I say the passion was like felt through the screen, I am going to summarize. I'm going to try to do Dr. Harper justice in summarizing his recommendations on how not to misuse equity funds. Number one, stop with the semantic substitutes for race that often gets used when creating policies disadvantaged students, disproportionately impacted students, disproportionately affected students, and his the one he hates most, at-risk students. Racial equity requires and demands that we specifically name the racial and ethnic groups that a policy is intended to improve outcomes for. His second recommendation, ask the people that the policy is intended for. What do they say through their own experience and expertise? People of color are experts on their own experience. They are experts on their needs, but very rarely because of the racial stratification of the higher ed workplace, including the California community colleges, decision makers who determine where the dollars go tend to be non-people of color and monochromatic groups. Equity-minded spending determination, specifically through the prism of racial equity, requires that these, non, these monochromatic groups go to people of color and ask them how these funds should be spent. Literally ask them, what would make a difference in your experiences and in your outcomes? Recommendation number three, compare how the funds are being spent equity funds have been around long enough for us to have something to compare. How were the funds spent in previous years? Did that expenditure of funds make a measurable and sustainable difference in student achievement, in student success, and narrowing equity gaps and eliminating inequities and disparities? If not, then why in the world would we spend the money for the following year the exact same way? The fourth recommendation, can we, as an institution, do a serious, honest analysis and fess up to and own what didn't work? What was a waste? And even what was the corrupt expenditure of the funds so that we don't do it again? For instance, toasters in the break room. Recommendation number four was birth due to the poor expend due to poor spending map the outcomes, the expenditures to specific outcomes. Outcomes like student learning, student development, student academic achievement, transfer rates, and certificate completion rates. Be able to map out how spending these funds in whatever way decided will make a measurable and sustainable difference in student success. And lastly, use disaggregated data. Institutions should search for underlying trends and patterns. Next slide. The last portion of the presentation was an activity. So we were randomly put into breakout rooms. Jessica and I, unfortunately, were not in the same breakout room. 
And um, this was the prompt once we entered the breakout room. It was about maybe seven to 10 people in the breakout sessions. Your college is receiving $2 million specifically to improve Black student academic success during the 2022-23 school year. How should the college spend these funds? Please allocate every dollar. Now, I want to preface this by saying that he used Black, but it could be any group. He wanted to drive home that we're not using the semantic language, okay? And so, uh, next slide. Well, what a coincidence. We already had a plan locked and loaded. We did not know that that was going to be the, um, the prompt. We, we had no idea. And I sat in, you know, I'm going to speak on my experience. I sat in my breakout session and I let my group members, you know, have at it. And I just wanted to see what would they come up with? What would they say? What would be their approach? Because I had this experience already. And so what I'm going to do now is introduce you to Ready, Set, Go. This program was created by Dee Dee Carter, Jessica, and myself back in 2019, 2020 uh, with uh, the redesign team. Uh, well, for redesign. And... Ready, Set, Go. Set is a, an acronym for the Student Experience Transformed. And I want you to put a pin in the subtitle, The Real Summer Bridge. Next slide, please. So our target audience is African-American and Latinx students who qualify for AB 705 co-rec classes. They have to fit the requirements of the racial, the race or ethnicity, and have the following experience. It has to be their first time in college, and they had to qualify for AB 705. And uh, that's done by GPA. Uh, anything lower than a 2.6 would qualify you for AB 705 co-rec courses for English and math, or both. Okay, next slide. Per Dr. Harper's recommendation, now mind you, we kind of did this before attending his session, but we followed, we followed it, all the recommendations. So I think we did a great job <laughs> on that end. However, um, there was a portion of this when we were building this where we did talk to the experts. Our experts were SNC students themselves, Black and Latino SNC students that were in developmental math and English classes. Uh, at the time. And I personally talked to people I knew, some of my friends that dropped out of college that are also Black or Latino or Latinx. And uh, the other expert was the research journals and publications that focused on HBCUs. And so there's a couple of factors that I'd like to point out or highlight here. Um, the environmental and social factor one was the peer influence. That was a really big theme when talking with SMC students. They basically, it was like, the notion was you're only as big as your block, right? And so if everyone kind of has the same experience, you know, that kind of puts a cap or, or ceiling on everything in your thought process. And then the other that I like to point out is the commute. So I am part of EGC, Equitizing Gateway Courses, and I'm on the ETAG committee. And one of the things they shared was the statistics, the research on how long students of color commute, how long of a commute they take to get to SMC. And I do not want to misquote, but I believe that it was over two and a half hours in commuting time. Okay, individual factors, educational leg legacy, including their parents, the lack of support for parents and family. And then lastly, the mindset. The, indi the individual factors here that research and talking to my friends and SMC, the theme 
that they had in common, what trended between all through all three expert groups was the mindset of why they're in college. It's almost like I'm here because I'm supposed to be here or I was told to be here. Um, I'm not sure why I'm here. There was this, how do I say it? Almost like an like a choosing the lesser choosing the lesser of two evils. Like either go to college or get a job and help pay these bills. And so it was like, well, I don't want to do that, so I'm gonna do this. Uh, that tend to be a mindset uh, that a lot of SM that that peer group that focus group shared. And then lastly, academic and institutional factors. The fact that the students must be full-time, 15 units per semester to receive maximum financial aid. And I'll share that with you in just a moment. Um, I'll elaborate on that in just a moment. Next slide, please. So after talking to the experts, our group categorized them, and then we shaped these goals. And the students helped us shape the goals too. Our SMC students, we took it back to them. Here's draft one. What does this sound like? What does this feel like? They, some they didn't like, some they were like, oh, we need a, more elaboration. And so this is the final draft of what the goals for the program is. A holistic approach to their emotional, social, and academic development and their maturity in college help students to navigate SMC expectations while achieving high levels of personal and social maturity and growth through developed social relationships with uh, fellow students and faculty, and three, refocusing of the mind. Next slide. So now that I've given you the background on our target audience and what the goals are, what the heck does this program look like? <laughs> okay, here we go. One very important feature of this program is the cohort model. The goal of that is to build social and cultural capital. What I mean by that is you take these group of students that have a certain, they have certain experiences. And this group of students is, that I identified in the target audience is approximately 1,500 students. That's what uh, the, the data showed uh, with IR and um, Hannah Lawler that they gave us. So you take this group of students and you group the students based on personality tests or what, a major, where, where they commute from, it could be by their GPA. It could be by their experienced, tra like experienced trauma, like shared trauma. Um, you group them, and that helps to start refocusing the mind. The amount per cohort should be no more than seven. And the reason why seven is such a special number is because the intention is to keep the focus group, I mean, is to keep the cohort small so that everyone feels seen and everyone feels heard. And then lastly, each cohort is assigned a care team. Now, a care team is comprised of an academic counselor, a therapist, a peer tutor for um, that will mentor for home, that's a, a peer tutor or mentor, and they also help with homework, and a financial aid representative. Now, we're gonna spend some time on this page, okay? I'm gonna break it down. What you are seeing laid out before you here is the ideal model of Ready, Set, Go, okay? Now, we're gonna take a pin out of what I told you, which was to put a pin in that summer bridge, like the real summer bridge. This is it right here. So let's say that this model would start in summer 2022. So it'll start at the beginning of summer 2022 and it will run through the end of summer 2023. That whole time span would constitute a full year and it was special, like special allocation of 30 units, okay? And I will break that down to you here. That incoming summer is appropriately titled ready because that's what we're going to do. We're gonna get them ready and we're gonna send them off. Right. And so the way we get them ready 
is to build them in a very holistic way. Now, this list that you see before you isn't in any particular order, um, but I wanna highlight certain things that we would do that semester. Uh, the holistic approach of developing a sense of self. Therapy, if they wanted or needed group therapy, individual therapy, real Black studies and real Latinx studies, like going way deeper than this K through 12, you know, generalization of uh, Black history or Latinx history. And self-care practices, so wellness, um, field trips, lunch being provided every day that they are with us. And then they would be introduced to the cohort, to their cohorts, and then certain therapeutic practices or mini assignments would be given to support the cohesiveness and the uh, cohort bond. Once the cohorts are formed, they would enter the fall 2022 in their cohorts. So meaning they would take classes together, okay? So the, this part is called set. This is where we start to transform the student experience. In the fall, so what you see here is the fall of 2022 and the spring of 2023, they basically have the same template. It's 20 units in total, which means they would have a part-time schedule for the fall and a part-time schedule for the spring. They would run on a block schedule. So they would still attend school Monday through Friday, 8 to 2 p.m. So keeping it very much like high school. Remember, these are incoming first time in college freshmen. Monday and Wednesday, they would do the coursework. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, that would be the support days. So on Monday and Wednesdays, it's English and math. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday would be the support days where they can continue therapy sessions. They can get homework help. They could uh, attend office hours. They could still go through a series of academic couching, like helping them explore like why they're in college, why am I here, you know, or those moments when they just want to just drop out, you know, they have someone to go to, which is why this one's academic couching. It's a little bit more than academic counseling, I guess. Um, yeah, and then lunch would be provided to those in the program. And so the spring would run the same way, okay? Now, in the off semesters, I guess I shouldn't call it the off semesters, in the shorter semesters, the winter and the summer of 2023, collectively it's 10 units. So in the winter, they would take one class, which is five units on a block schedule. It could be a science, you know, something, something heavy where it, where it can be very focused though, okay? Um, it would still be a block schedule. The hours may be a bit different due to the intercession hours. And then on the support days, the winter would focus on reflection and self-evaluation and readjust the plan. You know, maybe they don't like their cohort members. That doesn't mean that they're stuck with them. They can go, you know, to a different cohort and we would, you know, run that process again. Maybe they've changed their majors. And so we readjust the plan. We meet with them to readjust that. They would continue therapy if they want or need it. Academic couching will still be accessible, lunch and field trips. And then during the summer, so now we're talking, we've made it over a full year, right? So that's that bridge from ready to now you're ready to go, right? So for that summer, that exiting summer, that would focus on becoming alumni to the program to where they could become a mentor and they could greet the incoming freshmen and you know help create and sustain a community um, as now experts of the program. Um, and we could, would offer to stay in the program. And the reason that is, is I know, I know I felt with professional, some professional development where it sounds really good, right? Like you're in a two week program and they're giving you all these great ideas of what you could do to implement in your class and all that stuff. And it's just like, wow, I feel empowered. I'm motivated. I'm ready to go. And then after those two weeks, it's like, all right, you're on your own. And it's like, hey, wish I had somebody to reach out to, to help me uh, with that, you know, remind me of that piece again. And I hate that feeling because then it becomes overwhelming. And then my anxiety goes up because I don't remember all the details or what, do, how did they say do it? Like it starts to bother me. And so I wouldn't 
we wouldn't want our students to feel like that, which is why we would offer them to stay in the program um, or at least have access to all those resources. And of course, field trips and lunch provided. And then of course, a ceremonial exit because they've transformed and growth should be celebrated at that point. Um, next slide. All right, any questions? Really? <laughs> Go ahead, Jamar. Yeah, well, I don't have a question more, just a comment. Um, the program looks absolutely great. <laughs> uh, just to say the least for incoming AB705 students, this is exactly what it, they would need and uh, keeping it you know, uh, similar to high school, but then adding that extra sort of step of, oh, here's how you adjust to college. It just seems like it, it is the right thing to do. Like, uh, thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> thank you. I see Michelle has their hand up. Uh, hi, um, I'm interested to know how many students you're expecting to be involved in the program each year. What sort of numbers are you looking at? So with the data that Hannah Lawler gave, uh, it's approximately 1,500 students incoming 100. that qualify for AB 705. Okay, and what kind of funds do you have for this? Right, so the money. <laughs> <laughs> and how long do you expect to offer this program for? Is this now going to be a permanent feature at SMC, or do we try it for five years and then drop it and never hear about it again, which happens to so many of our successful grant programs. We start them, mm. we see some positive results and then whoop, the grant running runs out and nothing stays behind and, 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 it, and it sort of falls apart gradually once the money runs out. So sort of, uh, well, how, what is the long-term sustainability of this program based on funding? So, um Kristen, please jump in too. So this was something we designed and um, we loved the opportunity to share it in the context of Dr. Harper's um, discussion because we had come up with something that fit the parameters that he was suggesting. So this is our dream project. It is not ready to be implemented. It is a plan. We, we do not have a fund for it. This is something, this is our ideal vision. And so now the, the hard work is making it become a reality. And Maria, did you want to speak to that? Or are you asking a, a separate question? No, I do want to speak to that. First, I want to thank uh, Kristen and Jessica for um, sharing the work that they had um, been doing as part of the redesign work team that they were leading. Um, and that um, the work that they had put time and effort into um, is still very valid and important and needs to be revisited. Um, and in terms of funding, Michelle, right? Yeah, Michelle. Um, I agree with you 100% about grant funded activities, right? As a result of it being grant funded, unless the district were then to step in to continue the programming, once the grants run money runs out, it runs out, right? Um, this is where I think Kristen and Jessica, at the beginning of your um, presentation introducing uh, Ready, Set, Go focused on data, right? Um, and so what's important is, well, we may start with categorical funding. Um, if the data is showing that it works in meeting the goals that have been set by the program while they and that they align with the goal set by the institution, then I think that's where the district would be able to then um, help contribute to the sustainability of the program, so. right? Because we need the data to show that it's working. Um, and also for the data to show that not only is it working, but where are the areas for improvements and pivots to be made? And so as Jessica and um, Kristen have already noted, this is a program that um, we are looking to explore to bring to fruition. It's very, um, it was really designed to be an on-ground program, um, you know, pre-COVID. Um, COVID hit and they said like, this was 2019, 2020, it halted all of our movement across the campus, right? We need to make that pivot to just how to go everything remotely. And so now that we also heard on the student panel 
earlier today, there's still a great desire for us to remain in some sort of high flex hybrid kind of environment. So one of the you know things that I think we need to look at is also how would we transition this this program right to be high flex hybrid um, in this new reality that we all still find ourselves and will continue to find ourselves um, for years to come. Um, I do I do know that um, in terms of equity pathways and inclusion, the era, the division that I manage right now, there are definitely funds for us to continue to explore how to implement this. Not sure if it'll be for 2022 summer but definitely for 2023, because uh, we can explore that, we can re, um, revisit this, um, as well as bring in other partners that in your presentation were clearly identified, right? Mm -hmm. Counseling needs to be part of this, this, this discussion. We also have onboarding, you know, Jose Hernandez's team on onboarding could be part of these, this discussion, as well as um, looking at um, um, scheduling, Right? When you talk about a cohort and students taking courses together, that's a scheduling question. How do we do that? Do we have the resources to schedule and cohort? And if we don't, then how do we build towards doing that? Um, I do want to say something to that point, though. Um, I mean, I think, I think where there's a will, there's a way. At Georgetown, for example, they have a first year seminar for all incoming freshmen, and they break it into six week modules which is a nightmare right? <laughs> within a semester. And students have a lot of choice and flexibility. And uh, Dr. Randy Bass, who is the vice president of student development or whatever his title is, the guy who does the schedule, he said they worked on it for months and months and months, but they made it work. So where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, and it's about bringing all the people together. So we, we mm -hmm. had a scheduling crew mm -hmm. as a work team as well in the redesign that could be brought back together to explore how to yeah. make I agree with you. I mean, if the pandemic has shown us anything, is it, anything is possible. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I think Claudia, you had your hand up next. Hi, uh, I did have a question. So, as a counselor in the general and transfer counseling now, but a former outreach counselor, um, we've worked on various versions of Summer Bridge and things like that. Uh, so, I had a couple of questions. One, have you, I guess, thought about in regards to cohort, I think you mentioned, Kristen, about how to group them maybe in majors or, you know, area, um, like where they live or where they're commuting from, et cetera. So I imagine this would probably get tied into areas of interest or something of that nature. That would kind of be a logical tie-in. Um, but a couple questions. I know that you're aiming to do, you know, in the, the vision, it's like a part-time 10-unit uh, per semester. And I'm wondering, I guess, what would be, what's the incentive to that? Because we know that financial aid is tied to full-time enrollment and why not let students get, maximize their financial aid and, you know, and then just be strategic about how we're scheduling them to not overschedule them um, in content, you know, to be overwhelmed, but to maximize their financial aid. And then the, what was the other? Oh, and while there's pieces I think that are great about a five day a week support and mirroring that high school experience, again, having spent a lot of time doing outreach in the high schools, my concern would be addressing your point about the commute time that these students are already, you know, spending getting to campus and having worked with these new students, a big part of the incentive in trying traveling or committing to coming to a school that's, you know, not their closest community college mm -hmm. is that they may have options in, you know, flexible scheduling and not having to come every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess to the point of the student panel this morning and interest in hybrid mm -hmm. flexible mm -hmm. schedules, mm -hmm. how could we build that in as well? You know, how do you build in the support and obviously the academic course content, but also giving students some flexibility and reducing commute times from five days a week to three days a week. Um, and then also giving them, you know, really the capacity to then work because the reality is they often have other obligations, whether it's childcare or family commitments or a part-time job. And how do you really make that feasible for them where in this world of, you know, school is not, may not be their only commitment and how do we really, you know, flush that out for them? This is a great point, Claudia. Um, Oh my gosh, he said so much. I'm like trying to keep up with all of it. <laughs> um, so the first one was the financial aid 30 units. So the idea, now I don't know if this is possible. I know it's like a logistical issue, 
But what if there's a way to contract these students into 30 units in one year, right? And then if they, if let's say financial aid were to acknowledge that contract of the 30 units and still give them their full financial aid, which would then be allocated to them per semester as if they were taking 15 units and then taking another 15 units, right? That would be the idea, but they would still get their full financial aid. Now, could it possibly happen? I don't know. Theoretically, because SMC promised. So I think that's a conversation to have. So I think I just was interested to hear kind of what the, the, rationale was behind it there was okay. also there was also a model just real quick this is a, an aside um but about um in cuny at gutman community college in uh, manhattan where they have um they do a similar this was like not we didn't copy them but it's a similar kind of parallel structure at least where they have students that go along and they have a different like six week modules that they kind of mess with that allows them to not be overloaded with coursework in a traditional semester so that they get that experience of they have a, like a more intense two sections and then a less intense two sections and they've just played with time in ways that we haven't yet so i i'm not necessarily saying that that's a big ask i get that but i mean i do think there are ways for us to massage time where we can meet the recommendation or the, the you know the, the the needs of whoever is giving us the money and also meet the needs of the students and then to your second question about the commute, you're absolutely right. It's like the data shows that they're commuting two and a half hours, you know, possibly each way, uh, depending if they're on the bus or, you know, by car. Um, and then it's like, OK, well, then you built this plan that requires them to come to campus five days per week. I'm in I'm I would definitely be open into converting it to it being flexible, some of it being online, whether it is at the classes that go online or is it the support that happens online in a Zoom session? You know, like what does that look like? I'm definitely open to exploring that. Um, but I feel like if it had to happen, if there was a way for the class to be hybrid, so maybe they're in class one day physically on campus and then any of the support days, maybe they're they're physically you know, on campus for one of those support days. So it's like one of each, uh, a course day and then a support day for sure uh, in person. Um, the eight to 2 p.m. Now the block schedule was to really keep them because they're coming out of high school. So that time is usually blocked out for them already, you know, for the most part. And so it's like, well, what if we keep them in that structure and we introduce it in that way so that they can plan accordingly and maybe work the evenings or, you know, only make it 8 to 2 p.m. to where if they have to assist with their siblings or nephews or their own children, you know, that they could still, you know, do so accordingly. Um, that's why the, we really modeled what high school did Monday through Friday, 8 to 2 but for that part. and for no other reason than that, that they're used to that schedule already. Um, and then I, uh, can you remind me of your other point, Claudia? I'm sorry. Uh, the first thing was just around area of interest. And, you know, with the oh, yeah. camp, campus redesign, I, th I mean, I imagine that's a, a logical kind of cohort. Um, and then I think just my last comment would be, I, I think the thing that I applaud the most is that it is a year long program. I mean, I think that is probably where we have lost and maybe um, missed the the point with uh, some of our previous summer bridge programs is that it's a one undone. So mm -hmm. great job. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, Michelle. Um, yes. First, I want to say that I think it's a wonderful thing that you are limiting the students to just two courses, the English and the, and the math, because um, our incoming students really and truly have no idea how much time they need to devote to these courses outside of class to be successful. And so this automatic limitation is, is a really good thing. I am a little concerned that the only days that they see their instructor, however, are Mondays and Wednesdays. That's just two days at the beginning of the week, leaving this long expanse between the Wednesday and the following Monday that they next see their instructor. I'm much more of a fan of the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule for them to be interacting with their instructor and not leaving so much downtime. Um, speaking of time, 
I know it just came up with Claudia, but one of the things that I've been seeing with my students of great concern is the number of hours that they are devoting to work, work generating money. And I was wondering if there's gonna be a limitation on how many hours the students are allowed to devote to a, a, a job when they're in this program, because this is sucking up an inordinate amount of time. They just don't seem to understand this. I'm also a little concerned about this five units in the intercession. You brought up a science class perhaps and I teach science in the intercessions. And let me tell you, a five unit class during an intercession means they are going to be doing that science course 24 hours a day. There's going to be zero time for them to do anything other than that one course. It is beyond a serious commitment. And I seriously doubt that many of our incoming students in this program will be able to manage a five unit science course. Please, please rethink that. <laughs> Especially if they think they can somehow do that with a job on top of that. It's, it's right. gonna fall apart. It's gonna fall apart. I beg and plead with my students to do what they can to, to free up hours. And I know many of them can't. They really actually can't. And, and you're stuck. You're, well, what do you do here as an instructor in, in terms of, of support? Kristen, thoughts on those points? So, the, I, okay, so um, Jessica, can you go back a slide for me uh, to the model? Thank you. Okay, so I agree with you on the, the Monday and Wednesday being only for the coursework. Um, so Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, which would be the support days would still include homework help. So if you look in the, like that last, the second to last bullet point, it includes, um, homework help, peer tutoring, office hours, like whichever needs to happen, you know, um, and this is something that would be evaluated by their, by their peer mentors. Like, Hey, you need to go to that office hour one, because you need to learn what it's like to be in an office hour environment and what's, you know, what is it for? And then making sure that that's something that they do often and supporting them in that academic growth. Um, and so they, they could go, we could, you know, it could be part of a mandatory schedule where, Hey, on two of these support days, you need to be in that professor's office hour. You know, um, and then uh, to your other point of the science classes. So <laughs> the reason why off the top of my head, I said science is because I know that's also another, um, for lack of a better word, like the problem area as far as uh, passing rates uh, for our Black and Latinx students. And the idea here would still be to have that care team with them on those five units. And I would I would definitely be okay with front loading, like, hey, if you cannot work, do it. But if you have to, can we set it up? What would your schedule look like to help them go through that planning, right? The like a a, a, a calendar. What does your month look like? Where did, what time would you work? What does, you know, this look like? And as much planning for that as possible, because I know the reality is they have to help support their family financially. And um, we would just have to build it in around that. The care team would. And we can't bank on it, but you know, they're doing a, a universal basic income trial with Cal State, some Cal State students, a pilot. And the pilots I've read about in Stockton and, oh gosh, there was a couple others, but the, what I've seen with <clears throat> um, those kinds of programs, um, they really do work. Uh, the research is pretty robust that that kind of, um, you, you know, uh, unencumbered money coming to people to use as they need um, makes a difference. And so it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the Cal State pilot. And I hope that the evidence bears out that it's it's a it's a good way to go, and it's a different thing than financial aid that has all these hoops to jump through and all of these qualifications. It's just here's five hundred dollars a month that might alleviate. You know, again, it's not part of our program. It's not it's nothing we can bank on, but it is out there in the universe. And I'm hoping that as we think about transforming higher education, we're looking at those kinds of fundamental concerns and issues that our students are facing, and we're trying to come up with again. Not, not us at SMC per se from the state or from the feds, but you know, really interesting creative solutions to really give them the support they deserve.
James, I think I saw your hand next. Sorry, I'm negotiating all my buttons here. <laughs> uh, as far as the, if I understood correctly, sort of limiting work if you're a student in this program, I mean, I think that's great considering the number of hours that many of my students do seem to be working. I'm just a music teacher. Um, and I think it's pretty tricky though, because I, I'm not sure everyone would. Mm -hmm. These students are also frequently negotiating work for the first time, not all of them. So many of them do seem fearful about uh, mm -hmm. adjusting their work schedule, confronting a boss, you know, saying like, I really can't, I really you need this or asking for time off. Um, so that's a tough one. And I do remember even myself at school, there were certain programs that you were in and you were supposed to limit your work or you weren't supposed to be working professionally while you were studying and students worked around that all the time and just never said uh, you know, what was going on. And I just want to echo Michelle's comment that the three day a week kind of model, um, you know, being in contact with your teacher is important. I, I do see a lack of focus on you know three day three days off and especially if we have a monday off oh my god it's like come back after summer break sometimes for these kids to pull them back into focus so i don't know if these support days how required they would be but you know some elements i think should be so that they do need to make contact somehow on friday just to keep keep the momentum going even if it's just support and not a class per se those are my comments. Okay. So the support would be mandatory, like it's built in, it's not optional. And so what happens on the support days are any of the combinations. And I think to make it, to bring that more infrastructure would be to sit down with the counselor and say, hey, this is what this student needs to do for the upcoming two weeks. And whatever the counselor subscribe, you know, prescribes would be the schedule, you know, would be the, you know, let's say that they say, you know what, you we're going to make sure you uh, continue therapy sessions. We're going to make sure you go to the office hours for that week. Um, and that would be off data collected with, you know, uh, GPS, you know, just communicating with those professors. How's this student doing in this class? Oh, okay, so you need to attend more office hours. And so it would be prescribed to that student. Mm -hmm. And so it would it would run kind of on a, not necessarily on a as needed, but a who needs it basis. <laughs> well, maybe the um, support slash tutoring slash homework help could be structured in some way, meaning Friday would be more attached with content, meaning tutoring, mm -hmm. rather than other therapeutic counseling things. So that as they head off into their two day weekend to do the work, they have sort of this last little jolt of like, oh yeah, that's what I studied. Now I need to now put it into practice as opposed to other therapeutic things, which are beneficial, but maybe those be Tuesday, Thursday. Yes, agreed. That's interesting. Great, thank you, James. I think we have time for one more question from Michelle. I'm so sorry, I keep raising my hand, but this is so incredibly interesting to me. Um, as an instructor, um, I'm gonna ask something from the instructor side. Uh, what percentage of a class would include a cohort of these students? Would it be all, uh, uh, all, all of a particular cohort? Would it be just a small fraction of that class? How much does that instructor know about this program? How integrated are the individual instructors who are teaching these classes aware of the program and its aims and its objectives? Because I found as an instructor, oh, guess what? You are getting the, the Adelante section of students in your class. Your class has been designated this particular section and you find out long afterwards, you're like, oh, really? I, I had no idea. So, you know, to, to give the instructors that, that opportunity to prep for this, this very specific um, group of students. Uh, and so I'm wondering how much, how much uh, the instructor is, 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 is integrated into your program. Well, they would have to be, you know, definitely trained, right? So, um, and I would say Black Collegians and Adelante instructors, those that have already been designated as those type of, because they receive a stipend for teaching that class for the first time. And so they would undergo some level of professional development in understanding what are we, you know, what are we doing with this model and what are the features of this model so that they understand who they need to be in communication with in that cohort and which students belong to that cohort. Uh, 
Jess, you, you, you well, I, was, I was just going to say, if we start with, with math and English, that's already all AB 705 students anyway, oh, right? Okay. So there's also that piece of it. So, you know, their first few courses, would, they would be with other AB 705 co-rec meeting students anyway, right? And those instructors know that their pop their student population. So um, it's it's really when they go in beyond their first semester and they go take things outside of math and English that we would then to need to raise awareness and, and provide some kind of support. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Jamar, if you can sneak it in real quick, I think we have yeah, time. Well, yeah, real quick, yes. So like as a basic skills instructor, these are all the things that I incorporate or that we all incorporate in our classes. We've even bought lunch for students and things. So I think this is just a great idea to onboard students for their first year. Thank you. Thanks, Jamar. Awesome. Well, with that, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Kristen. Awesome. So cool. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of your flex day. Bye. -bye. Great job, Jess. <laughs>